we send emails, make calls over the internet, and discuss topics we take an interest in. Even our banking is going virtual. But what we take for granted today was only a vague idea 50 years ago. After the USSR successfully launched Sputnik into orbit in October of 1957, it signified the beginning of a new era of technology. Spurred by their competitors' success, the United States launched a communication network called ARPANET. ARPA stands for Advanced Research Project Agency and was a new branch of the military that made top secret weapons and systems. It was originally designed as a computer version of a nuclear bomb shelter to protect the information sent between military branches during the Cold War via a new rule for how computers interact. This new rule was called the Network Control Protocol, or NCP. This network would soon become known as the tool that we use every day. In 2009, there were over 1.9 billion web servers worldwide. The internet economy brings over 2.3 million jobs and 500 billion in revenue. The internet takes off as the world's fastest growing information network. Al Gore calls the internet the information superhighway. The term internet becomes used and the first host-to-host -host ARPANET connection is made. Before 1957, computers could only work on one thing at a time. This was called batch processing and was very ineffective. As computers got bigger, they had to be stored in specially cooled rooms where the developers couldn't work directly on them, so specialists had to come in to connect them. And programming at that time meant a lot of manual work because the indirect connection led to bugs and a lot of wasted time. Finally, in 1957, a remote connection was installed so the developers could work directly on the computer. Also, time sharing was invented in order to share the processing power of one computer with multiple users. The US founded DARPA in February of 1958. Previously, knowledge was only transmitted by people, so they planned a large-scale computer network to improve the speed of knowledge transfer and avoid the doubling up of existing research. This became the ARPANET. Together with a military network by the RAND Corporation in America, the Commercial Network of the F National Physical Laboratory in England, and the Cyclades Scientific Network in France, this became the foundation for the internet. ARPANET was developed in 1966. Universities were cautious about sharing computers, so they put a small computer in front of the mainframe, called the Interface Message Processor, which took over control of network activities. The mainframe was only in charge of the initialization of programs and data files. The IMP also served as an interface for the mainframe. The IMPs were connected in a network, called the IMP subnet. For the first connections between the groups, the Network Working Group developed the NCP, which would be replaced later by the Transmission Control Protocol. The only difference between the Transmission Control Protocol and the NCP was that it verified file transfer. Since the NPL network in England had a commercial basis, there were expected to be lots of users and file transfers, so to avoid congestion, sent files were divided into smaller packages and put together at the receiver. This was called packet switching. In 1962, American aircraft discovered mid- and long-range missiles in Cuba that were able to reach the U.S. This brought about a fear of an atomic conflict. At the time, information systems had centralized network architecture. So to avoid a break in the system, they made a decentralized network architecture. So if they lost a node in an attack, the system would still work. At the time, communications still worked through radio waves. So in an atomic attack, the ionosphere would be effective and the long-wave radio waves wouldn't work anymore so they had to use direct waves, but they did not have a long range. They came up with the idea of a distributed network with shorter distance between the towers and minimal interference. The Cyclades network in France had a smaller budget and thus less nodes than ARPANET, so their focus was on communication with other networks. In this way, the term internet was born. During communication between sender and receiver, computers would not intervene anymore. There would just be a transfer node. In this way, there is a direct connection with the receiver and an end-to-end -end structure. 
this connection gained in importance everywhere. Phone companies developed the X.25 protocol, which enabled communication through their servers in exchange for a monthly basic charge. The DARPA TCP was meant to connect computers through gateways. The International Organization for Standardization designed the Open System Interconnection Reference Model in an attempt to standardize the network from its ends. The TCP integrated the preferences of the OSI Reference Model and gave way to the TCP IP Protocol, a standard that guaranteed compatibility between networks and merged them, creating the Internet. By February 28th of 1990, the ARPANET hardware was removed, but the internet was still running. This was a great innovation for the world because it brought about a new information network, greater even than the libraries of the time. The internet heralded a new age of communication. We uh, have a thing called secured messaging, so our patients have the ability to email us uh, directly but it's on a secured line, so it goes into their medical record uh, without being displayed over the entire internet. And we use that a lot. It's a great means and ways of, of being able to take in information, reducing it, making it manageable, making it um, feasible to look at, uh, without becoming overwhelmed. Speed of communication, easy access to um, research. It takes more time to input it while you're like with a person, but then when you have it, everything's easy and accessible and quicker to find. I can email the orthopedist, they can look at it immediately and tell me what they think. It just makes it easier locating all the information in one moment versus having volume one, volume two, volume three of charts and having to go through page by page by page looking for things. Although, as with all good things, there are drawbacks as well. People expect you to respond, expect you to communicate. The first most negative thing that happened when we started using an electronic medical record is that in order to input data, we had our back to the patients, um, which was really an odd feeling. It kind of took the personal exchange out of it. Well, I think sometimes we uh, miss out a little bit on some of the one-on-one -on -one communication with the patient. Makes it faster, makes it smoother, makes it more convenient, but takes some of the, the personal interaction. We rely on the internet now, or for our computer, for everything. We are crippled without them. <laughs> kind of the difference between a phone call and a text. But what does the future have in store for the internet? I think throughout different metropolitan areas, we're going to have even more communication with other facilities, offices, hospitals. Remember Star Trek where uh, Dr. McCoy would just scan people and it would tell, our, tell them what was going on? We foresee a connected future where the world is at your fingertips. Don't look back because the future is ahead.